Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 226 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. I've been really excited about this one. Jacqueline Smuda and Sue Ann Braun, with an E on the end of it, is uh, joining me for uh, this episode to discuss their time as two gold goddesses, uh, Hathor and Myrti in Stargate SG-1. But before I bring them in, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this available on YouTube, click the like button. It does make a difference with the show and will help us continue to grow uh, our audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on both the Dial the Gate and gateworld.net YouTube channel says this is a live show. Uh, we have moderators in the chat that will be taking your questions for Sue Ann and Jacqueline. Tracy is in there. So thank you, Tracy, for uh, for being here for that. And in the meantime, we are going to uh, discuss Stargate history. We're going to discuss our lives and fandom and everything else that goes into it. Jacqueline Samuda, Nirti, and Sue Ann Braun Hathor, welcome back to Dial the Gate. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. Good to be here. This is so cool, guys. Jacqueline, how are you doing? Doing great. Actually, feeling very lucky because I'm sure many people know there's been a strike. And so that's yeah. affected work. And I've somehow managed to continue to work because of voiceover. So I've done a couple of really cool video games in the last little bit. And um, Hallmark movies aren't affected by the strike. And I'm I'm in the middle of shooting a Hallmark movie. So, wow. so that's really good. It's called Magic and Mistletoe. So that will... Uh, that will come out. I guess they're going to do a whole stream of Christmas movies. So look out for Magic and Mistletoe. Okay. And my episode of Virgin River just came out last month, uh, season yeah. five, episode five. Yeah. Okay, that's great. We will check those out for sure. I'll add those to the uh, description after the show. Sue Ann, how are you? I am really great. And thank you so much for having us back on the show. It's lovely to be here. And um, yeah, things have been pretty good for me as well. Actually, I was just saying to Jacqueline, I've just completed like a nine month run of a show, uh, a really cool character. Um, I know we had some Stargate fans come uh, from all over from Scotland and Germany mm. and gosh, I think the Czech Republic. Wow. So wow. I was really grateful for that. Um, so that's just finished and also working on some video stuff, video games and voice work, which has been great because uh, unfortunately the strike does seem to have affected the workload here, but it's all good. It's all good. It's, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm so thankful to have both of you. And I, it all, it's all because uh, uh, you guys were, were talking on, on Twitter slash X about getting together again, uh, ho hopefully at some point in the future. And it, it was just like, you idiot, you can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, you know, as a lark, you know, let's see, maybe they'll be interested in coming on together. And it's like, no, no, no. And they was like, yes, do it. It's like, here we go. So absolutely. And it's, it's, I'm delighted because this is not hyperbole. You two were a couple of my favorite guest stars from the show. Oh. Um, oh. And so it's, I'm really tickled to have both of you on together. And I want to talk about, you know, not just your experience in front of the camera, but, you know, in con with conventions and Cliff and, you know, oh. all these things that tie us together um, behind the scenes and really uh, prove that this thing this 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 giant ring right here has legs you know it's still yeah. going after you know 20 some odd uh years um Jacqueline what do you what do you make of it you know that that people are still you know asking us to con asking you guys to conventions and and new generations are finding the show what do you think's going on well I think it's that it's kind of an alchemy you know when you get the right energy the right people obviously the creators were fabulous. The writing was was great. It had a, a fabulous foundation in sci-fi, but there was also humanity and there was great humor. And then you take from that, then you get the relationships between the principal cast and then the opportunities for actors like Sue Ann and myself to come in and play these larger than life characters. You just dig right in. And then when you, when you arrive, you're on a set that's so 
warm and fun, you're welcomed to do your best work. And I think all of that creates an energy that, that goes right through the lens, right through the screens and into people's hearts. And it lasts because it's, it's memorable. It's, it's emotion, you know, emotion creates memory. Mm. Yeah. I so, yeah. will really second that. And I think something else, alchemy is such a good word because I think, um, the other thing that Stargate seems to have like, you know, what's, what do they call it? Lightning in a bottle yeah. that it seems yeah. to have done so perfectly is this combination of science fiction, great storytelling, but humor. Mm -hmm. I see so many shows, not just science fiction shows, but all kinds of shows. And look, we've been through a tough old time, you know, as a planet, yeah. <laughs> global pandemic strikes, yeah. wars. Um, so I get it, but I do feel that so much of entertainment today is very heavy handed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like, oh, and in case you didn't get the message, we're going to put that in the writing even more. And so there's no levity. There's no, there's very little kind of humor. And I think that uh, Stargate had that incredible combination of making it work so brilliantly. The kind of the humor, the writing, uh, and then of course, all these great sci-fi stories. It doesn't treat its audience like idiots. Like, right. I don't trust you right. to uh, get the message on your own. I've got to give one of the main characters a huge speech to telegraph it out as though you are second graders. Exactly. It's not necessary, you know? And a lot of the messages I agree with, obviously, you know, and and that that's the great thing about science fiction, to expose you to ideas that you weren't aware of before. But yeah. Yeah. treat me as an adult. You know? And it doesn't age, I think, for that reason. Like, you can watch it today. And and I've seen people at conventions bringing their children. And now their kids are becoming massive fans. And they can binge watch it today. And it still feels fresh. Yeah. 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 Because it's allowed to transform in new ways. Because yes. it was vague enough. I'm sorry, Suan. No, I was just going to say, I'm a big fan of the rewatch. I love rewatching series. Um, my husband and I are sort of like three quarters of the way through the Big Bang Theory for about oh. the third time, <laughs> and uh, I just love it so much. Um, but I, funny enough, the other day I was like, I can't remember, I had an hour or something and I was flicking through TV and, and Stargate was on and I was like, oh, I'm gonna watch this because it's an episode I haven't seen. I was sadly missed most of the plot. It was literally the last five minutes. But the bit I saw, I was like, yeah, this still holds up. Yeah. And it holds up because it's great acting, it's well shot. I mean, probably the only thing now that would challenge it is that we've come quite a bit further in terms of um, special effects and that sort of thing. But, you know, but there's something also kind of cool about that. I quite like that it's sort of 90s retro, you know, like our eyes, you know, I think like today. That <laughs> oh, gosh. Different way. Yeah. 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 And that even through the course of the show, the uh, the visual effect of the eye glows, season eight, they they updated exactly. them. Someone was like, this this fuzzy, you know, light is, is we can do better. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, uh, so Jacqueline, you were tapping on something or into something earlier that I wanted to to bring up. You were saying that, you know, when you uh when you came on to Stargate, you felt, you know, that it that it was it was a there was a comfortable um uh place to to explore and to to associate with with like minded people who, you know, were really on the same page of the same mission. It wasn't a, a contentious set. And I, I wanna ask you both this, but Jacqueline, did you did you feel free to, even though your first episode, Fair Game in particular, but when, yeah. when you came back later on um, for uh, season five, did you feel freedom to uh, experiment or to, to try things with the character in the confines of the mission of, of the script? I, I think that came a little bit later, okay. but I will say, you know, just from jump, uh, coming onto the set of Fair Game, you know, with uh, Vincent and Ron Halder, the three of us were just, we were just embraced. And the three of us got along incredibly well. And so it was like fun from the first moment, like even my, my makeup test, you know, I had to have my test with Christopher. Oh, his last name is escaping me. Such Judge. a brilliant artist yeah no no a makeup artist oh makeup artist yes and so he had created the the eyes and so on for near t and they had done the hair and and then i was you know walked over to uh rda and presented and he was like beautiful 
beautiful. Got up, hugged me, and, you know, and off, off we went. And we just had this fabulous time and just having a laugh from the first moment. I mean, Vincent was in, you know, playing you was in this costume. I've told the story at conventions, but he was in a costume that was authentic enough that like in the period, you couldn't sit down in it. And he literally had to tilt himself against walls to rest. And I think in <laughs> period times, they would have little, you know, stools, they'd shove up the back of the skirt so you could perch kind of thing. Yeah. And we just, we just had a blast. And of course, all the jokes with the you, the name and you, and, you know, <laughs> first pretty much, we just had a scream right from the start. So yeah. Christopher Penhay. Yes. So, hey, thanks. Absolutely. Sue Ann? Yeah, I mean, I sort of concur completely. I obviously was, I was in it right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I remember very clearly, and I've also told this story quite many times, but kind of going in for the audition, not really knowing what it was. They were quite vague about the character. It didn't say anything that she was a goddess. I was just like, why does this woman speak, uh, you know, in the third person? Is she mad or royal? And so I sort of played her, a bit like that. <laughs> um, and then I remember very clearly, and I don't know if this is a true story. I mean, this is what I was told. But basically, at one point, Michael Greenberg was married to Sharon Stone, apparently. And it was just before she hit it big, 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 big time. So she had signed on to do Stargate and she was going to play Hathor. And then she did a little movie over the summer called Basic Instinct <laughs> around about that time. I don't know if it's exactly that, but basically, long story short, she was like, I'm not doing your show. I'm a big movie star now. And they had to find someone else. <laughs> and Thankfully for me, they got me. I do remember, though, being told on the day one, they were like the same thing in the makeup tests. And they really wanted this kind of Egyptian. Um, and obviously, I've got curly hair. So they were like, no, we need to put it sort of straight wig on. Um, and they couldn't quite decide what they were going to do with the makeup. And so I sort of had half my face done and like half my hair in curlers and stuff. And I was waltzed out to get something to eat. And I was literally standing with a bagel, a half a bagel. <laughs> when I felt this tap on my shoulder and it was Rake going, Hey, I'm uh, Richard Dean Anderson. And I was like, Oh, I had to. That's <laughs> oh, like, yes, but I'm a goddess, really. Don't run away. <laughs> and that was my introduction to the lead of the show. <laughs> Jeez, um, but yeah, they made us feel so, so welcome because I remember also I arrived, I think, on a, a Thursday or a Friday, and I was only actually uh, scheduled to start shooting on the Monday. So I was on the lot having my costume and um, hair and makeup tests and stuff. And then Chris, Judge, just came over and he was like, hey, I'm having a party at my house tonight. Do you want to come? And I was like, yeah, it would be great. And John Lennick uh, really looked after me, took me out all weekend. We went for dinner. We went to this unbelievable party at Chris's house on the Saturday night, which to this day, I still don't know how I got home. Yeah, It was bad. That sounds like um, a Christopher party. <laughs> <laughs> recovered on the Sunday I think then we went to go and see Lilith Fair as well which was brilliant oh, yeah. and just I was just completely like welcomed into the fold of a family you know and I think that and I didn't know as much then as I do now that is exceptionally rare particularly when you're with your lead cast so yeah. it really left in a um, kind of indelible impression on me because I always thought if I'm ever lucky enough to be like lead cast and something for long enough, that's how you treat your guest stars, you know? Yeah, With and that, that extended to conventions too. The, the very first convention I did in Australia, in Canberra, I was, you know, kind of getting my stuff out of my suitcase and just taking off makeup and stuff. And there's a knock on my door and there's Chris Judge saying, come down to the bar right now. You're joining us and go down with him and his wife and, you know, other people. And we just had this absolutely fabulous time before the first day of the convention. And it was completely unexpected, but it was great. It was great. Jacqueline, when did the two of, oh, Sue Ann, go ahead. I was just going to ask Jacqueline what she thought about, you know, her first convention, Canberra, yes. like, did you kind of, because when I got my invitation, I was like, is this a joke? I, I, I 
just I, I just love to know what you thought, Jacqueline. It 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 was. I mean, this is a story I've I've told many times because it was unforgettable. It was crazy. It was at the peak, I would say, possibly of of Stargate's popularity. And I, oh, sorry, I'm I'm switching two things. Blackpool, I think, was the first. So yes, Blackpool, England. Okay. Right. Yes. So I uh, I arrive and I'm told that I'm a surprise guest. Right. And I'm feeling like, well, no one's going to know who I am. And I'm told that I'm going to be picked up by a van with the other performers. And we're going to go to a green room. And then we're going to introduce ourselves to the, get, to the, the attendees. And we get into this green room. And it's all of these brilliant, hilarious actors, of course. And they start going out on stage one by one. And I had been told, you just say your name and when you're going to be signing your pictures. So I'm like, okay, I'm a little nervous. And everyone goes out and they're like, da-da-da-da-da, do stand-up comedy. And I was like, oh my God, I'm totally unprepared. I have no idea what to say. And then, you know, I'm also asked, since you're the surprise guest, you're going to climb into the sarcophagus behind the stage. And then, Sue Ed, you've heard the story, I think. And then because it was a huge stargate on the stage and it was a massive like airport hangar i mean it there were thousands of people there and i'm like you climb into the sarcophagus <laughs> with your live mic and we're going to push it through with the sound and light effects and then two jafar are going to the, the sarcophagus lid is going to slide off two jafar will help you out and i'm like and then i'm just going to be like hello um you may not know who i am <laughs> anyway so i get into the sarcophagus and I'm like, this is the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. And I can feel it sliding through the Stargate. <laughs> and I get out and I say, well, I was jet lagged when I got in that thing, but now I feel great. And there's a mini bar in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Way to recover. Yeah, but it was, it was spectacular. It was so amazing. I couldn't believe everybody knew who I was and everybody jumped to their feet and they were like, yay. And I was like, wow. Like I hadn't quite understood how powerful the show was and how far reaching it was. And so that was a real education very, very quickly. Gary Jones amazing. talks about the same yeah. thing. You know, he was like, I, I, I'm, you want me to do what, you know, the, yeah. you just don't, you, you come in, you, you, you do your part, you have a good day. And yeah. and you you move on to the next project and it's like oh yeah this thing has stuck in people's craw and just won't get loose for some people and yeah. it's just it's this wild thing that keeps on uh, meaning new things to new generations again and again even as I rewatch the show it's like oh this has new meaning now than it did or this yeah. was talking about then what's happening now. And some things are just more relevant. And you guys are the pieces that tell that story. And yeah. so we're you know, being able to meet you and talk with you. We feel, you know, an indelible part of it. So that's cool. Sue Ann, what, what was your first experience you were mentioning? Well, my first one was also, funny enough, Australia, although Blackpool, you said, sorry. Um, and it was Sydney and it was so bizarre. So I was doing a... Uh, kind of a show called Offbeat Broadway, which uh, if anyone's ever seen or heard of Forbidden Broadway, is an American show with kind of four singers and they basically pastiche all the musicals on Broadway. So, you know, you've got four people doing the whole of Les Mis kind of thing. Yeah. And this was the South African version with two boys and myself. And we were in a town called Durban. And this is like just as the internet is starting. I mean, hello, dial up. Remember that, anyone? <laughs> And the hotel manager comes to me and says, I have an email for you um, from somebody in Australia. They want to fly you there because of some Egyptian part you played. I was like, what? Anyway, read this thing. And then I was like, this has to be a joke. This has to be a piss take. I mean, like, it cannot be real. So I just ignored it. And they wrote again, thankfully. And then I showed it to my dad. And I was like, what do you think, dad? Do you think? And he's like, oh, I think you should reply. So we kind of constructed an email and immediately it came back. Anyway, long story short, I get on the plane and I just remember the flight out because there was no one else with me from Stargate. And I, I was like, am I about to be shipped off to some sort of weird cult? <laughs> yeah, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, what happens? Or worse, I was like, what happens if I get there and there's no one to meet me? 
oh. and nobody. So, I mean, anyone who's ever been to Australia, their security is hardcore. I mean, mm. four times I'm pulled over and they search my luggage and they're very polite, but they're like, you know, and how long are you staying in Sydney? Yeah. And what is the reason for your visit? Yeah. And I was a bit like, um, oh. Anyway, I come through the doors and thank goodness, it was about two o'clock in the afternoon for them. I thought, let me just quickly put a bit of slap on in case in case there's one person to meet me, you know, I better try and make myself look a bit more respectable. I came through the doors. There was a banner that said, welcome, Sue Ann. Koala, little fluffy koalas and about 40 people. Oh, and my I'm God. Like, oh, my God. Same sort of thing. And then I was also with Chris and his wife and they were brilliant. We took us to the hotel, went to the bar, had, went up for lunch, wined and dined, had no idea. Next day, next morning, walk into this room and they're like 400 people chanting. And I was just like, oh my God, this is extraordinary. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, amazing. But it is amazing that Stargate has definitely, and it's universal. It hasn't just like touched a nerve in certain countries. You know, I remember when I was growing up in South Africa, Knight Rider for some reason in South Africa is like uber, uber, uber popular. Like Little House on the Prairie is an obsession mm. in France. Yeah. Like it's an obsession. And it's funny how these shows, for whatever reason, people in those countries really kind of attracted to it. But Stargate is universal. Yeah. I mean, that's the crazy thing about it. We've got a Canadian and a South African born UK talking yeah. about uh, foreign countries visiting foreign countries for conventions for an American-based United States paramilitary unit, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like there's something in there that keeps on rattling in people's brains. Jacqueline, for a show that was 25 years ago. Right? That's the other thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it is absolutely amazing. And I'm so delighted to be a part of it. Jacqueline, when did the two of you meet? We and met. tell me about your little brood that you got going, the Goa Wolves. You know, I'm constantly seeing photos of you guys and Peter Williams and Cliff. Tell me about that when you guys got started. Well, I always get mixed up as to which was the very first convention where we were all four together. Sue Ann, was it? I think it was GateCon. It was, it was GateCon. It was yeah. GateCon because I remember you and I went for lunch. Yes. And we went to Granville Island. And so... And it was just a coincidence that I happened to drive past Sue Ann, her Lyft driver or Uber driver had dropped her in the wrong place. And so she's That's walking right. from Granville Island and I'm like, hop in. And so we go for lunch and I remember sitting down and just having a blast. And Sue Ann, I remember you telling me, my husband was like, you're going for lunch with this person. You don't know, you know, you don't know her very well. How's that going to go? And we just had the best time. Yeah. And, you know, Peter, I, I'd known Peter for some years and I'd done an episode of Da Vinci's Inquest and he was in it and had been very supportive of my performance. So he didn't even actually remember that performance, but I remember how kind he was to me that day on set because it was shortly after I'd, after I'd moved to Vancouver. And because he's Jamaican and my father was Jamaican, we've always had an affinity that way. Yeah. And then I'm telling you again, that word alchemy, like the four of us in a room, like it just was like, meant to be absolutely meant to be and and cliff and sue ann obviously have a long history and a great yeah. friendship and and you know both from south africa and yeah. and there was just something that we clicked and we were friends like immediately yeah that's yeah. how i felt anyway same no a hundred percent uh second that and i remember after our wonderful lunch it was an amazing restaurant on a bridge like i did sort of like uh, incredible views and then you took me shopping in this really funky, amazing district. And I bought two cool, cool pieces of clothing that I still have. Cool. Um, and same, yeah, it was just, it has always just been easy, effortless. And then we kind of were all together in New Zealand, I think, Australia and New Zealand. And we really bonded then. And then, of course, Kalmar happened, which was like, we were just, I mean, and I'm, of course, now in hindsight, so grateful we had that because that was before the pandemic and obviously it was the last time we were all together. Yeah. Um, and we just had these hilarious like three days. Do you remember us filming in the hotel? 
car doors. Just Peter had gone to bed <laughs> and I had an injury. So a guest had lent me her wheelchair so that I could be shuttled around the convention in the wheelchair. <laughs> so it was sitting outside my room and we had all actually I had pictures of us lounging on hotel beds all together and yeah. and then we were all kind of going back to our rooms and then oh my god Sue Ann and Cliff got a hold of this wheelchair and just started doing the most hilarious routines up and down the hallway and I thought we are going to get like we're going to get you know slaps on the wrist yeah. from the hotel but Peter was in his room he didn't hear us apparently yes. there's videos of those pranks and just and then even after we had all finally gone but we laughed so freaking hard I was yeah. weeping yeah. I go I go back to my room and then I'm like oh maybe I'll bring my wheelchair inside and I lean <laughs> out my door and there's Cliff leaning out his door because he was gonna come and grab the wheelchair <laughs> and then we were like oh my god it was so it was so funny and you know the funniest thing also was just like watching him completely lose it so oh. I mean, I've posted the videos before, but I will happily post them yes. again after this interview, yes, or maybe please. send them to you, um, David, and you can put them on your I can. show. They're about three, I think. Um, yeah. And Jacqueline doing brilliant filming work on all of them at one point. <laughs> I'm so tired, Jacqueline. She was like, I'm so tired. Art is hard. <laughs> but it's true. And also because Cliff, you know, he you know, certainly on the show, I mean, he was terrifying. He, he, yeah. he's such a yeah. brilliant actor and yeah. very intimidating and scary in, in his character. And then when you, but just the funniest, most hilarious, most fun, warm, cool person, yeah. you know, with a very interesting history and, you know, and his, his love for life was just absolutely infectious. Like he, so to see him in those light moments, like it's just such a contradiction to what you see on screen. Like he's played on, across his career. He's played really scary kind of mean characters. Yeah. And, and this, this other side of him is just so, so fabulous to see. That man knew how to live. Oh yeah. You know, oh, you yeah. couldn't not say that about, you couldn't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and always remembered. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I can't, it's so funny because weirdly I was going through my phone the other day and the four of us have a WhatsApp group called the other fab four. <laughs> and... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I found the message of me leaving the message for Jacqueline and Peter where I was just like, I can't believe I'm having to say this, but this is what's happened. Um, and it's still sometimes I'm like, I can't, quite believe I'm never going to hear him laughing or talk to him again. Mm -hmm. But the comfort is that he went doing something he loved yeah. and he did live his life every single day. Like he lived life, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, no, his, his performance, um, uh, he, we had a preview of him in season five with Summit and Last Stand. Uh, it was, it was, they called it Gould Mardi Gras, but it really was like Gould auditions in terms of yeah. what uh, uh, was going to be happening for future seasons were they ever to come back. And they were, they were deciding, you know, who was going to um, uh, potentially be the next big thing. And then season six starts and, uh, O'Neill gets captured and uh, we see an outline of him at first. And later in the episode, he walks into this room. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this. And I, as an audience member, Stargate was light and fluffy and fun, but he walked in and I was scared. I was like, Jack's not going to get out of this unscathed. This is going to be bad. And that was Cliff's gravitas. Yeah, he yes. wore those, those outfits did not wear him. He wore those outfits. And oh, you know yeah. what I mean by saying that. And, yeah. you know, it's just it's th this energy, you know, he could turn that thing on. And it was like, I'm terrified of this guy, you know, and he he was just a powerhouse. He could pull yeah. anything off. Yeah. You know? I met him on the set of Continuum. And so yeah. my introduction to him was being one of a multitude of golds standing there. And he had to have a presence that dominated this entire room and this entire group. And I was, I was blown away. I was like, this is a, 
this guy has got stage presence like crazy and he's the gravitas is a great word for it he really commanded the space and i i admired his work immediately mm -hmm. absolutely yeah and you knew him for how many years sue ann because everyone's always surprised so you knew it yeah they knew each other you know yeah so we met i'm trying to think when we exactly met i mean weirdly somebody sent me a photograph again which i've also put up of us so he was in a South African soap, like a very, very famous soap opera in South Africa called Egoli, which means city of gold. It's a uh, city of gold in Zulu, which is what they called Johannesburg. And um, he was in Egoli and I at the time was working as a, an announcer slash presenter host for like the first independent TV channel ever in South Africa. And it was kind of like MTV meets VH1, um, and it was called Mnet. It's still going today. And I was one of the first kind of continuity hosts, you know, so you would like tell people what was coming up. And at the time, Egoli was so huge that they would do these like road shows around the country where they would literally go and meet the fans. And I mean, if you think Stargate had a feverish, like majorly excited, turned on fan base, you should see these guys. And they guess, I think we met on the first one was when they asked me to host it and we met then, but weirdly also realized that we had mutual friends. I mean, we were babies. I must have been 21, 2021. Mm -hmm. And we realized we had mutual friends, but we didn't really know each other well, well. We just kind of like were high or whatever. And we kind of got to know each other over these um, series of road trips, things that they did. And he was with Colette then. And I remember very clearly because she was a bit like, I'm not going out with you. You're like this big movie, you know, like all the girls yeah. like you. I'm not running after you. I met Colette. And she I was great. The sex he was like, man, so I'm like, I just, I've never, I just, I have to have her. He <laughs> was like, I have to be with her. I have to, she's the one. Um, and that was true, you know. Uh, so, yeah, we've known each other for years, but really became good friends, funnily enough, on Stargate conventions, because I went to L.A. We saw each other a little bit in L.A., but we're not really that close. And then I left L.A. and I came to London. So then we had like probably about five, six years where, you know, it was pre-Facebook, I think, where we didn't really, it's not like we didn't talk, but I didn't really see him. And then we did a convention together and that kind of reignited the friendship. And after that, he said to me, let's stay in touch. And then he would email me and, but you know, not all the time, not often. It was really that kind of Kalmar was the one I think where we, we just all had the best time. We went out for this fantastic dinner, the four of us. Do you remember that sort of oh, I loved it. Like converted church or something? Oh, yes. wow. And lots of talks and, you know, Peter's also so brilliant to hang out with because he's a great storyteller. He's funny. So these two would go full Jamaican and then we would go full South Africa. <laughs> that would be an interesting night. <laughs> the conventions uh, are, the, the only half of it is about the fans. The other half is is uh, the, the, the cast getting uh, back together and some of them meeting for the first time and falling in love with one another as people. And, yeah. you know, as a convention goer, you know, when the throngs are coming on, I have to sometimes remind other people, got to give them space to, to catch up with one another too. That's a great thing about the green room. People are coming yeah. in and out and, and you know, they can come in, get a water and catch up and have intimate conversations with one another to bring each other up to speed on their lives. And it's, it's a, a week of, of really, really um, a memorable experience. And then we spread yeah. to the four winds again, you know, but there's just something about the the convention experience that, you know, we all we all get back together for it, and I'm so thankful for them because you know it helps us remember what's uh, most important, and that is to dream, and that's what yeah. the show the show allows us to do is dream. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've got some fan questions here for you guys. Ooh. Tracy wanted to know, uh, just curious, Jacqueline, the, the Hallmark movie, was that the one in Halifax, Nova Scotia? They're shooting one here now. No, it's not. Um, Hallmark is so prolific. Like, yeah. I think they're going to have 45 Christmas movies to air. Very wow. Soon. 45. Can you imagine? 
So this this one is called Magic and Mistletoe, and it's shooting in Vancouver, BC. Are you the magic? I, I'd like to think I'm a little piece of the magic. Anyway, I'm the mom of the lead. So Sorry. it's a lovely character. It's very warm and, and sweet, like many of these films are. And this is probably the third Hallmark movie with the word mistletoe in the title that's been shot in the last three months. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, there's, they, they shoot constantly really here. Yeah. And they do good business, you know, you can't blame them. So yeah. absolutely. Zuby Force says, uh, Sue Ann, if you could have introduced some South African slang into the character, what would it have been? <laughs> um, how's it China? You all right, Brew? <laughs> Which means hi, hello, my pal. Are you all right, my brother, I suppose. <laughs> Brewer is Brewer in Afrikaans is brother, and it just sort of became shortened to brew, uh, and probably lacquer, um, which if if you're Afrikaans you'd say lacquer, and if you're English you'd probably say lekker. Ooh, that's lekker, which is just nice, groovy. It's fab. It's all those things. It's lacquer. <laughs> cool. Just wanted to know. Um, uh, what it was like ever working uh, with Peter Deloise. Did either of you work with Peter Deloise? I didn't, sadly. Okay. I, I worked with Peter a few times and was he the first? He didn't do yeah, did fair game. I think that was Martin Wood. Um, Peter right. is yeah. awesome on yeah. set. So relaxed. And I mean, I, I did a movie with him just a couple of years ago, so I can speak to a span of like over 20 years. Yeah. And I, I can say that even 20 or 25 years ago, his confidence and his air of relaxation was absolutely communicated to everybody he worked with. He was so funny and so efficient at the same time. Like, so he would direct like he was telling a joke and he would never, he would never talk down to cast and he wasn't bossy he'd just be like well you know a guy comes into a room and he's gonna go over there and he's gonna do this and then and go you know and everyone be like oh yeah okay and you know off off we go and then he also gave me a, such a fabulous opportunity in um oh geez david please help me yeah so there's fair game then the next episode uh, that I, when was, I um oh, Sandra. the uh it's, it's cassandra's episode um Yes. Oh, God's sake. Season five. And it was my memory. I used to be able to pull these off and then I get hit 40 yeah, and, and it's I like, oh I my God. And it's, um, it's, uh, I want to help. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Cassandra. Well, th that will come to us, but everyone understands it's, it's Cassandra's episode and I'm terribly, you know, evil and I've been hiding. Right of passage. Life. Yes. Right of passage. God's thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, anyway, so I had this big standoff with, yeah. you know, with Dr. Frazier and all this stuff and, and they're going to actually let me go and they should never let me go, but they do. They're going to let me go. We make a deal and I'm about to go on the Stargate and I have this exchange with RDA and um, I don't even know if I have a line to be honest, but, or maybe I had one line and Peter was just like, milk it. Just <laughs> And I just stood there gazing into RDA's eyes with a whole bunch of dialogue in my brain, even though it wasn't coming out of my mouth. And it was one of my most fun moments. And just to be given that permission, you're a guest, he's the star, you make him wait and you let him just sit there and feel your power before you exit this episode. And it, it was awesome. And that's, that's how Peter was as a director. He was just very, wanted people to bring themselves, bring their best and have yeah. fun and not waste time. Like yeah. he was efficient and fun and light and everything got done and everyone was in a good humor. Yeah, that was a great episode. I, I love that scene because this is the reason why we're the good guys, even though we know that she's going to go out and destroy another civilization more than likely. But all you're communicating through that experience is, you're a fool for letting me go. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't let you go. Uh -huh. And it's just so juicy. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Absolutely. I, I need to watch that. It's a good, <laughs> rite of passage. It's a good show. It's really good. And then I know I watched all of Jacqueline's stuff and more for Half a Host, but it's been a while. And talk about forgetting things. <laughs> I, no, absolutely. I don't remember last week. I think that you, oh, really? 
Oh, that you didn't. Re- okay, I, I, I remember. I think that you are the only two who have successfully seduced, or attempted to seduce rather, members of the SG One team because Hathor obviously did her number in Hathor, and Nearty did the same thing to Jonas as well. So that's yes. kind of interesting. Where you used you you used Get your off. beauty, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Our wily ways. Yes. Well, you know the gold. They've they've got a gold. Have got a gold. So they're <laughs> they're gonna do their power trip. I'm gonna give you power. That's right. So yeah. Uh, let me see here. Um, question: Teresa Zakova Matalova. I'm sure I butchered that. I apologize. Question for Jacqueline: Nearty was pure evil. Was it difficult playing her? Uh, at any point, and what did you most love about uh, sinking your teeth into the character? Mm. Well, I I think Sue Ann and I have both been asked similar questions yeah. in the past, and I and I think we both have a similar answer. And to be honest, it's extremely fun to play an evil character. Yeah. And the main thing is, in fact, you you actually have more in a way to sink your teeth into because what an actor is really playing when one is working is subtext. So you've got your your script and you've got all the lines that you're going to say, but what you're actually doing besides saying the lines is what's underneath the lines, that subtext. And if you're a bad guy, you've got tons of subtext. You've got more subtext than the, the average character. So you've got more to sink your teeth into. It's fun. You have to justify, and that's also fun. Why? Because you, you can't be doing something, oh, I'm just evil. You know, that's not a good enough You reason. have your reasons. That's right. Yeah. I want to create a Hoktar. I want to develop mm-hmm. a science to its nth degree. I'm will if some eggs are going to get broken, <laughs> you know. So I've got to I've got to justify what I do, but it's for the good of this larger than life project. So um, so that part wasn't wasn't difficult. It was just it was gen- genuinely just fun. Sue Ann. Yeah, I mean, I I think the other lovely thing is, you're right, there's more to sink your teeth into. And I think the other thing is that playing somebody who is very removed from who you are is massively challenging and exciting. Um, and that, for me, was one of the greatest things about Hathor because she was way more, uh, well, certainly more evil, way more forthright, far more used, like, openly played on her kind of feminine wiles um i mean it would be i think such an interesting character to see today like what they would do yeah. with that character today because also you know she was in some ways a product of television in the 90s and i think it would be a very different hathor today and i'd be really interested to see what they did with that if it ever Came back. Has there been any like update on that? So on the-, the rumor is that something's going to be getting announced, you know, potentially at oh. at uh, I think it's is it New York Comic Con? There's there's a possibility there, but it could be a rumor. It, it could be completely wrong. So right. my inkling is that we may get an announcement here, you know, in the next six months now that everything's clearing up. But you're right. No, I think modern uh, Hathor. I think modern Hathor would be also be seducing the women. I think I would think she would be going after everyone, you know, because yeah. you know, I I and I think that that would be, I think that that would be an interesting an interesting angle to approach. So yeah, and I think she I just would want to add too that the only hard thing that I always found with Nearty is that I always wanted more. <laughs> that was I was well, like, don't all goddesses. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, when they, when they, uh, when Wod, I think it was Woden, it was either Edgar or Woden, who's, whoever snapped your neck in season six, I just remember, I just remember going, <laughs> it's just an expletive that came out of my mouth. It's like, that's it. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you do, you don't stay dead in sci fi as Continuum showed. And, you know, hopefully we'll see, we'll see the same for Sue Ann at some point here. But I mean, still, it was like, oh, gosh. That's that's the main storyline, right? But at least you went out with a snap and a bang. So yes, true, true, so, absolutely. <laughs> um, bang and snap. <laughs> <laughs> Alex De La Nuit. what was it like working with Amanda Tapping? Oh, she's awful. <laughs> <laughs> she's. <laughs> 
You know, I am joking, Internet, please. Um, Have either of you worked with her as a director yet? No, no so I would. Close. Oh, me too. I would love to. I would love, love, love to. Um, we, the three of us talked about potentially trying to do something. And then at one stage, Kate Hewlett and as, our, as well was in the conversation. But one day, one day. Um, mm -hmm. She is everything you would want and hope, I think, from a leading lady. She is warm. She's friend, like unbelievably friendly and welcoming, utterly professional, knows how to have fun, but without it uh, impeding or interfering yeah. with the work. Um, really good at her job bloody talented and today a, re a really excellent director and an, a gorgeous human being and you know, really i mean i can't i can't think of anything horrible to say about that yeah so down to earth wow. I, I came very closer i was you know sent to network and um amanda was a big part of that for a, a continuing character in motherland and it didn't work out because one of the existing cast members was kind of moved into that character mm. but um but just that process was great. Like she actually reached out to me personally after my audition texted me and said, you know, that was great. We're sending you to network and you were awesome. And, you know, and that's, that's not typical. So it was just very generous of her to do that. And, and she's just, she's just so down to earth and just a real human being, like not fancy, not like, Oh, you know, I'm in the film industry, nothing like that. And, and that's, she's just fresh. She's just real and very talented. And very disciplined. Yeah. Homo Erpel, um, and this is true. I've been seeing uh, some Stargate fan films pop up with some of the Goa world. Are you uh, interested in uh, a, or would be be opposed to appearing in fan films as your characters? Oh, I, I don't know. I, um... I'm not familiar with them. I don't. I don't know what it would entail or what they look like. I think it would just depend, really. I'll send you a link to one that a okay. friend of mine, uh, Samuel, uh, did. He's he got. Uh, oh, who's the actor? Uh, oh gosh, my brain sucks. What is this with forty <laughs> people? So he he was Seth. He played Seth, mm -hmm. and it was Robert Duncan. Uh, he's, he's, uh, I don't know if he's done it yet, but he's agreed to, to shoot one. So I think that's an interesting direction to explore for these characters. They're shorts. They're like 10 to 15 minutes long. So that would be really right. cool to get all the gold back together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, burned back us. Sue Ann, would you w be willing to share your husband's cinnamon bun recipe? <laughs> if only I knew it. <laughs> I, um, I genuinely don't know it. Uh, <laughs> okay. I took one look at those babies and I was like, I can't go anywhere near that. Right. <laughs> if I, I go know. near that, I'm going to end up like Jabba the Hutt. I've got <laughs> oh, Not even. God. I mean, they're so good, but I think they're about 2,000 calories for one. They're just ridiculous. But I'm sorry, I don't have the recipe. I genuinely don't have it. <laughs> and Eva wanted to, Sue Ann wanted to thank you for a wonderful show. You were wonderful as Belle. Lots of oh. love from the Czech Republic. Oh. Thank you. And what thank program you so is she talking about? So this is the musical, it's not really a musical, it's an immersive piece of theater that had jazz in it, wow. um, which I've just done for the last nine months. And basically it's based on a true story, an amazing woman called Belle Livingston, who was her and another woman called Texas Guinan. There's a good story for us, Jacqueline. Um, they were known as the Queens of the Speakeasies and Basically, she, Belle, had this extraordinary life. She was born in Kansas, kind of, according to her own legend, found under a sunflower um, as a little kind of a baby left in a field, adopted by this family, kind of had this unbelievable zest for life right from an early stage, ended up moving to Paris, made and married four times, wow. devoured men, devoured money. I mean, she was unbelievable with money. In like 1802 or something, she lost $100,000 in a night and then managed to get it back. But basically, she, after the fourth husband, she's forced to come back to Manhattan after years, after like 30 years of being away. And she comes back to Manhattan and she finds it very, it's in the height of prohibition and she finds it very um, pedestrian. And she's like, where's the glamour? Where's like, why is everybody... You know, they're drinking in these rat infested dives, like where are the great clubs. And she has this idea to build 
like an uber super speakeasy which she does uh which is called it was called the 58th street country club and our show it was mainly about the opening night of this club which was raided it was apparently the prince of wales was there and al capone was there it was so everyone was so excited to be at this opening that the whole of manhattan came to a gridlock and it's kind of her story but also with um three course meal and then like an amazing jazz band who performed throughout the night and then also bell does a few songs but yeah it was an amazing part to play so you were recreating this opening night for the guests exactly wow that's exactly. really cool i think i've seen your outfit in that i, I think i've seen yes, the that... red dress the yeah. long red dress oh man that was good absolutely yeah. and she was such a kind of outlandish so it was amazing also to get an opportunity at this point in my career to create a role and you know really the I auditioned a year ago for the workshop and then kind of we devised it together. You know, we made this show uh, and there were parts that were extraordinarily difficult. Um, and also like, it's so different doing something with live where people are, there's a live band and it's like a club. Mm. So I, in the beginning, it really threw me because I was like, oh my God, I'm talking and no one's shutting up. Why is nobody stopping? They're all talking, they're all eating. <laughs> Because of course, like a nightclub, so you have to like control the the audience, and that took a good month, I'd say. And then also that combined with the service and waiters running out in the bar making drinks, you know. And some nights we'd be in this like there's one very poignant moment in the show that she talks about the one man that she did love, and he unfortunately died two weeks into their into their marriage. Like literally, I'm you know talking about the love of my life, and there's a bartender like mixing a big drink, like. Quack, quack, yeah, so I'm going, do you want that with ice, my love? Do you want it with ice? Yeah, no. All right, darling. <laughs> yeah. Like you're in Manhattan. Um, Jeez. Yeah, I heard some crazy, crazy things, i got to tell you. <laughs> oh. Yeah. To we tell had some... Yeah. Well, just the... people's responses were bizarre. So one night, again, I don't know if people weren't, sh I mean, we had a lot of discussions about this with the organizers and the producers because I was like, I don't, sometimes I think people don't know what they're coming to see. They think they're coming to a jazz club, which it is, but it is also a theatrical piece. I mean, I am playing a character. This isn't Sue Ann. She's called Belle Livingston. And, you know, you walk in between the tables and you're face to face with people. And sometimes I sat on people's laps and, you know, she's very sort of outrageous and flirty and all that. And then just sometimes people would have these really bizarre. So one night there was a woman who was quite loud. She clearly had a bit too much to drink. And in the middle of this, and I'm talking about again, the count, which was the hardest bit actually, because all the raucous party bits people could get down in. But in the second act, it goes very quiet. The lighting goes down. They've had their main course. They stopped like drink service for this bit. You know, everything is indicating be quiet. It's now a performance. And she tells you this heartbreaking story of the man that she loved. And it's very beautiful. There are these cherry petals that drop from the thing. And oh in the God. middle of all this, yeah, it was, it's very moving because they get married in Japan. And she talks about like, whenever I see cherry petals, I'm, you know, I'm back there. And then there's this beautiful dancing and she just stands under these petals as they fall while somebody's singing, um, Solitude, which is that beautiful Billie Holiday, in my Ooh. solitude, beautiful song. And one night in the middle of all this, a girl just leaned over very loudly to her partner and went, oh, it's so good, isn't it? I didn't know there was a story. There's a proper story. But loud like that. I mean. Huh. Yeah, lady, do you mind if we continue telling it? I mean, yeah. And then we had another, I mean, sorry, I won't waste any more time, but just there was one woman one night who was clearly, I mean, off her face. And it's very distracting when you're trying, you have to, it's like acting with antenna because yeah. you're like, something's yeah. happening here, but I'm talking to these people and do I need to stop the show? Do, what's happening? And I could see all the security were like, and I don't know what the problem was, but apart from the fact that she was drunk, but she kept complaining and, and she had a voice like this, you know, be like, fuck on, ah, it's not proper dancing. That's not 1930s. She was like, 
going on and on and on about how the dancing wasn't the right style and she remembered and finally I just thought I have to nip this in the bud and I turned around and I went honey because she's a servanter Miss Bell Livingston was a servanter and I was like honey could y'all stop your guns from flapping for one hard second so I can tell a story good for you and the whole room just went and she looked at me and I went yeah I'm looking at you baby yeah. <laughs> talking all the way through now can you hush the hell on up anyway and she did it was like anyway and then the rest of the audience burst into applause so you've got three yay. Other people going, yay and this one woman but for the rest of the night she was like this <laughs> well that's just too darn bad <laughs> you, know? you took back control that's fantastic so like oh i came off stage and i was like <laughs> of course yeah you have to respect that everyone else is also here and has paid for the same experience that you have. Exactly. So, uh, you, you don't disrespect the room. You know, you're you're there as a guest. So, exactly. Good for you. <laughs> so, Jacqueline, uh, before I wrap this up, so uh, you were in uh, Trial by Fire on um, Virgin River. Um, yes. So that that aired last month. Uh, yeah. What was your What was your part in that? And uh, can you can you tell us anything about uh, being back with Martin Wood? Well. <laughs> I was so glad to be working with Martin as always. Every time I've worked with him, it's been it's been great. I was playing a really uh, nasty lawyer. Basically, I'm the lawyer who intimidates the young girl who's been who's been sexually abused, and I'm making her try. I'm trying to make her look bad on the stand. Yeah. So, it, it absolutely, you know, one of those characters. Yeah. Um, I loved doing it so much because it felt like theater because you're you're in a courtroom and you have to stand up and you have to command the space and so on. And they, the way they shot it, we were block shooting it. So it, it really did feel like theater in the shooting of it. So I absolutely loved it. Now, watching it, my character is all about creating the reactions from this girl who's who's one of the leads of the show. So you don't see a lot of me. You really what you see is the effect that I have on her. Um, but I can tell you that the whole experience was just fabulous and, um, yeah, and I was pretty, pretty nasty and I, and I look pretty nasty too. I gotta say, <laughs> I thought I wanted to apologize to my children. I was like, if mommy can look like that, that's <laughs> scary. <laughs> Absolutely. And so magic and mistletoe, this is going to be coming out in Hallmark later this year. Yes. All right. Yeah, looking forward to it. As this was terrific thank you so much thank you both for coming on uh to do this episode you know i i've been doing the show now for for uh three seasons we're about to close out our season michael shanks has just uh agreed to come on for our season finale um and everyone was always like when are you gonna bring a couple of people on you know to do some of these like convention style episodes and it's like i'm getting to it you know? <laughs> <laughs> um this was a treat and this, uh, I, I would, l I, I can't wait to see you both uh, again in, in the future here because you guys do not, uh, never underestimate the role that you played in bringing um, this magical space to life. That so many people, I, I can tell you so many people, they get to the end of it and they go online and they say, what should I watch next? And yeah. it's like, start it over again. And you guys are a part of that. So thank you for making that magic happen. Thank you. It's a big deal. So. Thank, thank you so much, David. And I have to say you, honestly, I heard in your introduction that you've done, what is it now, over 200 shows? 200 yeah, we're at 226. Amazing. That is unbelievable. Something's working. Yeah. 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 But really, kudos to you, your passion and your love of the show and the actors and the people, like all the fans. You know what I mean? You you really bring in that like familial feeling. And I absolutely doff my cap to you because yeah. it's not an easy thing to do and you make it look easy. And that's probably the biggest compliment I can give you, Thank apart you. from the fact that you're just lovely as well. Yeah. Thank you. And I second all that and, and congratulations to you, David. And so nice to see you, Sue Ann. I'm going to message you after we hang up here. <laughs> let's hope let's hope that we get to see uh, one another, all three of us, in person at a convention. Absolutely. 2024. Come on. Let's, let's do it. Let's make do it happen. It. Um, I'm, I'm so ready for that. <laughs> Thank you both for coming on. Thank, Thank you. you so much for Thank having everybody. us. Bye, everybody. everybody. I'm going to wrap Bye. the show up, guys. You take care of yourselves. It cheers. Bye-bye. Jacqueline Samir.
Jacqueline Samuda and uh, Sue Ann Braun, Nirti, and Hathor on Stargate SG-1. This was a treat. Um, I, I can't thank them enough for, for joining me for this episode. And I hope to do more episodes like this, uh, particularly in Season 4, as, uh, as we move uh, forward. Because it's a, it's a great way to bring up um, new memories. Because you've got two of the artists feeding into each other and, and coming up with stories that they've uh, they've they've put away in the back of their minds. Um, Tracy, thank you for moderating for this episode, uh, or rather for uh, uh, yeah, moderating in the live chat. I really appreciate uh, you you standing up and and pulling this one off all by yourself today. And thank you to everyone who submitted uh, questions. I apologize, I wasn't able to get to all of them. Our schedule is pretty thick in terms of the content uh, that we're moving forward with to finish out uh, season three of Dial the Gate. So next week, we've got uh, John Gadetsky. He's going to be, his pre-recorded show is going to be October the 14th at 10 in the morning. I may slide a couple more in here. We're trying to figure out the schedule for for, uh, the end of the month because we've got a few that are still pending and I want to work them in. Uh, it's just a matter of scheduling. So we'll see. But definitely John Gadetsky is going to be uh, on this Saturday, October the 14th. It's at ex- the episode is all about Atlantis. And he shared, he shared, what did he share? He shared pre-renders, pre-visualizations for the pilot rising for the Puddle Jumper dogfight with the darts and the rising of the city itself. And if you keep it on Gate World, you might just see the uh, the the scene from Rising, uh, the animatics of the city coming up out of the water before the episode airs. So keep it on Gate World for that. Uh, Stargate Science with Mika McKinnon and David Hewlett has been rescheduled live Friday, October the 20th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Heather Ash. Writer and story editor Stargate SG-1 is live Sunday, October the 29th at 12 noon Pacific time. And two hours later, Michael Shanks, Daniel Jackson in Stargate SG-1 is joining us live October the 29th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. My thanks uh, once again to Tracy for pulling this uh, episode off by herself. I really appreciate uh, all your work, Tracy. Uh, My producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury. Uh, My other moderators, Summer, Anthony, Jeremy, and Reese. And big thanks to Frederick Marcoux over at Concepts Web. He's our web developer on dial the gate makes uh, makes the website uh, continually possible thank you so much uh for tuning in for this episode of dial the gate i hope you enjoyed the show and the contents my name is david reed i'll see you on the other side